y'all, it's Sarah. I have got some colorful artwork for us to do today. Um, my best friend is redoing her master suite, and I decided to whip a few little pieces together for her and thought I'd pop in and see if you guys wanted to tag along. So, um, here's one that I've already finished, and I don't know if you guys can see that. It's got some nice dimension to it. This is a really lightweight piece. It's a really good size. It's 18 by 18, um, and... I'm going to jump right into this because I want to be able to show some of the tools that I have demoed in previous videos. I want to kind of show them in action. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I'm going to be using, of course, is my Ready Board brand foam core. Um, if you don't know what this is, this is found in your office supply, school supply area right next to your regular poster boards. It is two thin layers of paper um, adhered to about a quarter of an inch of um, foam. This one in particular I wanted to show because um, I tell you guys often that it's much better to... Uh, try to cut along lengthwise because that's the way that this seems to be manufactured um, aka if this was wood it would be like cutting along the grain when you cut the shorter edges you tend to get more dragging and you can kind of see that you see these waves um, in this where it was manufactured this is why I usually suggest cutting lengthwise um, because of that so I wanted to point that out really quick um, I'm gonna be using one full sheet to show you this tool and I'm going to be cutting it down. You guys know me. You're going to see the scraps later on um, in another project. So I don't feel like I'm being wasteful on that. The other thing that I'm going to be using is um, a couple of one inch strips for my framing. These have already been painted. Um, if you're interested in the videos on how to get the different wood looks, those are separate and that way you can customize any craft that I show you to really fit um, exactly what your decor needs are. So go in and check those out to determine what color you may want to do your framing if you want to frame them at all. Um, the next thing I'm going to be using is uh, my glues and adhesives. So for the construction of mine I always use just regular um, Dollar Tree hot glue sticks. They seem to do very well for me. I've not had any problems with them. The other thing that I'm going to be using is um, the Craft Bond glue stick. The reason I'm using this is I want to adhere down my paper to this surface without a lot of moisture, um, without a lot of warping, especially on this project. This one's going to be a very thin one, so we're not going to have a lot of um, layered and stacked pieces to prevent warping or anything like that, so you really need a low... Uh, moisture glue. This one works really well. Um, and then I'm going to be using some of my tools. So let me go ahead and start pulling those out and show you what tools I'm going to be using. One of the tools I'm going to be using is, is my little groove thing here. This is made by Logan Brand, which is the same one that makes my mat cutter that I use. Um, you can see this little guy, he's got like these kind of angry mandible looking things right here in the front. They are supposed to cross like that. I've had questions. They do cross like that when you um, have your blades in place. The reason is, is that they need that in order to make that valley into your foam core um, to create kind of that shiplap look. So this one was $19.99 at Hobby Lobby. This is their... Um, special everyday price so you can't use a coupon on these but I want to tell you that this is actually still a really good price because if you look this same one up on Amazon it's $29 um, and if you want to know more about these things this one is the XTC 2001 if you want to know more about them check those videos out I'll be sure to try to link that um, below the other thing that I'm gonna be using is my Logan compact mat cutter and I know that they call these things compact if you hear that these things are really heavy 
Um, really large and durable. It's pretty much made very similar to the average paper trimmer. However, this is normally made for cutting um, matting for fine art, um, but it also works on our foam core. Mine is an older model. I don't know that um, you can even find these. Now, I know a lot of people have had uh, really great luck finding some of these cutters on their Facebook Marketplace. So check that out first. Hobby Lobby has been running a remarkable sale on these. Um, theirs comes with the matte cutter um, and the cutting blade handle. Mine did not. I had to buy mine separately. And as a matter of fact, the set that they're selling together is still cheaper than what mine single cutter came individually when I first got it. Um, so in order to use this guy, I'm not going to be using um, the measurements today. I'm going to need to measure out by hand. So I'm just going to remove this part. And I'm going to slide it out of the way because I'm going to bring in uh, my foam core sheet. And it's going to work a little different than when we use the handheld part uh, because... I want to show you, can you see that the blade, the, this is the track for this thing, and the blades line up right here. So that's about an inch and a quarter offset to where the blades line up. Um, so in order to work around that, I've got to go ahead and make my marks. And for mine, I'm going to do about a two inch shiplap look. I don't have to mark this entire page. I can just mark... Um, one part of it and just be able to follow that. I'm going to remove my little label here and all you're going to do, and you don't even have to draw a line all the way across this. You just kind of need to know where to line that little triangular notch up at. So once you get your marks notched in or marked in, we'll come back and cut it. Okay, so all of my marks have been made down my one edge. There are a few things that I want to show you about this, and every single one of them is going to be different. My model is a 301M, um, which is a few years old. The newer ones, I think, are in like the 700 range, so their design may be slightly different. Um, but this will kind of give you the general idea of how these uh, these really cool things work. So for mine, um, one of the things I want to show is that mine has a stopper on one end. Uh, this allows you to get your sheet really nice and flush um, and line it up perpendicular to your cut bar. That way you're not going a little cattywampus. Now... There is one thing that I want to point out with using um, this groove tool with this. When you're using this particular tool, you can see that we have a point where it comes all the way to this end. Now, when it's on its track and you get to this very end section, you kind of, your hand tends to want to drop off just a little bit. One of the things that I suggest doing is take just a little scrap and bump it up against that very end so that your hand doesn't want to try to drop and um, cause problems with your lines right here at the very end. The other thing that I want to say to you guys is that when I demoed this, and I, I did it multiple times, and I used the blades that originally um, had been packaged out with it. I struggled a lot and I kept wondering what I was doing wrong. I assumed it was a user error um, and that I just didn't have it uh, you know, I wasn't holding my face right or something. It turns out I went ahead and switched blades and have, um, newer blades in there. I am not having the same problems. I'm not having any jaggedness. Um, and I hope that this, this particular instance doesn't prove me wrong, but I'm having a much easier time now. And I wanted to point that out. Okay. So for me, because I do use this tool, I kind of etched a little mark here on where this part lines up once it's on the track. So I kind of have an idea of where it lines up typically. But I'm going to zoom in really quick and let you guys see. 
So my little mark is right here. You notice that we're not pulling up against this track like we would with the regular cutter. And I'm going to line this little, that little notch that shows me where the blade is right up with that little pointy part. Now I'm going to go ahead and get it in its track and start putting pressure up here so that it cuts into this edge really nicely. I hope you guys can see that. I'm going to scoot this back to where I can get, um, I like to get a nice smooth sweep across here when I'm pulling that tool across. If not, you do end up with a few jagged spots um, if you happen to kind of change pressure. So let me show you kind of how that works out. Let me make sure I didn't lose my alignment moving it around. And I did. Okay, so here we are. We're lined up. We've got this, this guy on its track. Make sure it hits right where it's supposed to hit. I'm going to make sure my bumper is up against this back so my hand doesn't fall off um, the edge and make it jagged. And literally, this is all it removes is just this little bitty wedge. Now, I do not set mine anything past about um, the three to four mark. I have been asked if I would make a chart for this. And here's the problem with that is we, as crafters, if you've been playing with this craft um, any amount of time with me, you know that each one of these can slightly be different. So what measurement may work for this one might not work for the very next one that I start. I usually don't start any deeper than about a four. Um... I don't take it any further past that. I don't want to weaken my piece and I don't want it to end up, um, this tool is ultimately made where you can kind of bend this and put angles in this. I don't want to go that deep. So I don't ever push this past a fob to get my shiplap look. And you can see how quickly that goes. Since I have my little notch down, um, that I've made on my cutter. This makes it a lot faster for me to get the alignment and just whip on through. Okay, I'm not going to make you guys watch me cut every single strip. I just kind of wanted to show you how nice this worked out. Okay, so you can see I've got um, my notches kind of grooved in at every two inches. And I want you to kind of see how that does. It literally just takes just... Um, a little bit out of there, kind of leaving everything else intact. So the next thing that we're going to do for this is we're just going to go ahead and mark it down and trim it to our 18 by 18. So I've got my little piece marked here at 18 inches. Um, and I'm going to show you really quick how the other part of the trimmer on here works. So I've got it marked out. I am going to align that mark right here along this bar. My little blade is going to hook on this track. Now, if you notice, the beveled sharp edge of this blade points this direction. That means I need to pull it that direction. So I'm going to go to the opposite side. I've got everything bumped up and nice and flush. Get it on its track. Push it down to make sure that it's engaging before we hit this edge. And there we go. A nice, really clean cut. And I want to show you an alternative to that also. If you can't find the hand cutter or don't want to make the investment, because the little handheld part um, is... Um, $30 on its own, which is why I said finding the deal at Hobby Lobby is pretty amazing. So I wanted to show you just using the cutter. Now, mind you that we've got these marks at every two inches, which means this was a 20 inch width. I already know that if I cut one little section of the slats off, I am going to get um, that 18 inches. So I don't even have to mark this one. And I'm going to get it flush up against here. And I'm just going to come in with my handy little blade. Hit right against this metal guide. Hold everything in place. 
And same thing. Either which way you go, uh, you get a nice clean cut. Whether you're using the handheld um, cutter here with this, that's why I said check uh, Facebook Marketplace. So many people have gotten such great deals on there. I've almost been a little jealous. I've had mine for quite a bit of time. I really wish I'd have gotten some of the deals that I've seen people get. It is handy, and if you're really in love with this as a craft, it's certainly worth the investment. And I wanted to show it in action other than just demoing it. So here we are. I've got my little um, shiplap pieces ready. The next thing I want to go into is framing. So I get a lot of questions about framing, and I've got a video that is just specific to um, framing, finishing out pieces, all of that kind of thing. But there's still a lot of questions on the framing situation. So I want to show that in a little more detail. And hopefully this doesn't get too long. It's supposed to be a simple craft. But um, I thought this being a simple craft would really make it a good opportunity to really explain this a little further. So I'm going to want to miter my frame on this one. Um, and you don't necessarily have to. You can always do the kind where the um, your framing just adjoins like this. But to clarify how you get your measurements for your frame. So whatever your overall piece is, we know that my overall piece now is 18 by 18. Um, whatever your overall piece is, is what all four of your framing pieces are going to be measured out as. And I know that's the part that gets confusing for people. So when it's all said and done and I mark these off, I should be at 18 inches by 18 inches. So I'm just gonna go in and show you that I literally am going exactly by the length that this piece is. And you could have easily already cut them all down to 18, in 18 inches, but I wanted to show this that we are going completely flush with the length and the width of what, oops, actually I'm not going completely flush. Um, you want to go completely flush with whatever the length and the width of your final piece is. And I know that's the part where people wonder, um, you know, adding extra for that pointed part of our miter. But you don't actually have to. We're, we're pulling a little bit away, but we're pulling it away from this interse intersection of the frame part. Um, and by that, I mean... Um, our longest portion will be on this outer part, and you'll see that. I'm going to go ahead and trim these down. So now I have every one of my pieces cut out, and I wanted to show this. They literally are going to be the same exact size of whatever your edges are. And you can see they're no longer. Um, they are right at flush. So in order to go with that 45 degree angle, and this works for any single one of these that you do. Now I'm using a one inch strip right here. If I was using a two inch strip, I would simply do the same thing and adjust for it at two inches. So in order to get a miter, um, an easy way, this is a one inch strip this way. We're going to want to go one inch this way. And we want to mark out a perfect square. We're going to do that on both ends. So whatever we mark, we want it to be a perfect square. So if this was a two inch piece, I would make sure that it went two inch by two inch, three inch by three inch, whatever way you're working that. So in order to miter this, we want to get our 45 degree angle by going from diagonal to diagonal. Now we're not losing any length on one side of it. And we want to keep long sides together and short sides together. And you'll see what I mean. So I'm going to start up here, especially on this little skinny piece. I want it to bite into that and get a nice clean cut. All right, I'm going to do the same thing. Now, here is what I'm talking about. We're not going to lose any length. We're going to cut up that way so that our long pieces are on the same um, the same side. 
So I'm going to go from corner to corner on this one. Now, this is what I want to show you. We have not lost a single bit of length on this. We kept the full length on that long side. And the only place that got short was this one, this side. So that is how you measure out. Um, I want to show you a little cheat. And you guys, we will be giving one of these things away this month. So keep an eye out for that. But um, I have this little guy. My husband made this for me and he made one for you guys um, to give away. So if you're really head first in this craft, uh, you'll have an opportunity if you can't make one for yourself. So let me show you how this works. Now you can pretty much use um, any square that you get from the hardware store. The one thing that you want to look for is make sure that it's got this little edge that helps you set it on there nice and flat guys I want you to just see how how well the faux wood look really is because if I put this fake piece of wood against real wood you almost cannot tell the difference so the way this works is I just line up the very end come down and there's a perfect 45. Same thing. I flip it over. This one he made to fit my little work surface because I don't have a lot of room. He did make me a larger one where I don't have to flip it. It just, I can do um, one in one direction, one in the other. The one we'll be giving away will be like this. And there you go. I have two perfectly mitered edges. I'm going to bump it up against there, slide this piece down, and I always just take my blade and put it right at this bottom here to make sure that I've got it straight to that edge so I don't lose any of my length. And you can see, just a nice clean, this is pretty much um, the equivalent of a miter box, but for foam core. Okay, so you can see I've got all my edges mitered now, and the only thing that I've done um, that you didn't see was I went in and took just my previously used sponge that's still a little damp and moist and I went in and touched those ends where we mitered to make sure that when they hit up against each other we don't have any white spaces kind of showing there. The other thing that I want to tell you on this on this style or this particular one I'm going to jump in and do one more step that you don't usually see me do, and there is a reason why I'm doing it, especially with these grooved pieces. It helps hide any white spots later. So I could adhere this down and, and paint out this side like I normally would, but you still run the risk of seeing a little bit of white right here where those grooves were. So I'm going to do something that you guys aren't used to seeing me do at this stage, and you have to be cautious because you can see I've already gotten a little bit here. But I want to come in, and I know this is a little scary because we're wanting to keep this mostly white. But I want to hit just a little of this edge because if not, you can see some of it when we, um, even when we go to clean this up, even when we go to adhere those down, you can see a little bit of it. Um, and I would, I would rather not, especially on one that the edge and the framing and all of that is going to be um, so thin and lightweight. So you can see what I'm doing. It's coming off on the edge a little bit here. And that's what I want it to do because then when I lay this down, there is no chance of any white peeking through on me. So I'm just going to go around this whole piece and do that and give it a chance to dry so that me personally, because if you have seen, 
I'm notorious about fingerprints. I'm going to get give it an opportunity to dry before I go any further into it. That way I don't accidentally transfer um, fingerprints, wet paint, all of my white part. Because I really do want that to stay nice and bright and white. Okie dokie, hopefully I've given this enough time where I don't end up with any fingerprint issues and you guys can now see kind of what I did there. And as I glue this down, you'll kind of understand why I did it that way. So my next step is just to go ahead and um, glue down my framing. And this is where I'm just using regular hot glue sticks. And I'm just going to use my fingers to help flush this up against these edges. And we'll just go all the way around. And this is one of those points where you may want to go ahead and dry fit a little bit. Make sure that everything's going to line up. Let me reload my gun here. And I'm flushing right corner to corner. Now maybe you can see kind of why I did it the way that I did. There is less likelihood, um, especially on these edges where we have cut into the groove of getting as much of the white to show through. So I'm going to finish putting these down. Okay, so there you go. You can kind of see now I'm not going to have any issues with the white showing in. And you can see where I hit those white edges. Um, my framing covered all that up. So my next step is going to be to add my artwork or my art color. So... I have a sheet of scrapbook paper and this is why I went with the 18 by 18 measurement because scrapbook paper usually comes in um, 12 by 12. So this gave me a nice little border around my piece. You could certainly just go in right now and attach that straight down, but I kind of wanted a little more dimension to this since we were doing this as such a light piece. In order to get that dimension in, I'm going to come in with my glue stick. And I'm going to glue this down really, really nicely to just a kind of uh, separate solid piece. And you notice that mine has gotten some bends and damage in it. So that's why I'm trying to go ahead and use this piece. And a quick tip on doing this is that I found the best thing to make sure that I have an adhesion um, that is just as nice and smooth as almost wallpaper uh, is using a popsicle stick but instead of holding it this way like you normally kind of would want to do doing it flat and you'll see what I mean so I am going to glue this entire piece of paper I want to make sure it's got full coverage I don't want any air bubbles. I want it to stick to this kind of backer piece really nicely. Um, and if you saw me do this on the poster one, which was a much thinner um, piece of paper, this really helped me get a good adhesion on it. So I've got the full thing covered. I made sure to really get the edges. Um, you don't want those to start peeling up. The really good thing about using something like this is that no matter what paper you choose, whether it's um, uh, scrapbook paper or maybe just a, a piece of um, printed paper or anything like that, that low moisture content for that glue stick not only benefits us when it comes to not damaging our foam core surface but it also um, a lot of times you'll notice with certain glues and even like Elmer school glue you'll notice that sometimes there is some um, warping in your paper so I'm just going to take this stick 
and push it really nice across here right up on those edges and then I'm just going to take a ruler and trim this down from edge to edge and we'll have a nice um, solid piece to attach to that really quickly as I go to cut this I wanted to show you how to kind of get it really really flush without actually cutting off any of your paper or having any white space so I lined my ruler up and this blade is so thin that you can kind of feel right where it hits the paper and push your ruler up against it so you know you are literally lined straight up to the edge of that paper. I'm going to start way up here so I'm biting in well before I cut. And if you notice, I did not cut any of my decorative paper nor did I have any white edge there. Um, same thing with this edge. I'm going to do my blade, kind of pull it up against this paper and use it to get this ruler completely flush with that so I don't have any white space. Okay, so I have mine really nicely cut out. My edges are really good. I've got clean cuts. However, I did want to show you really quick if you didn't happen to get it super clean along the edge, Take a fine grit sanding block, and I prefer a sanding block when working with the foam core over the sanding sheets, simply because the sanding block is flat and it's hard, and you can keep it flat against your piece a little better than you can um, with the sheets that want to curve around it. So, last thing is to just come in and put it in place. Um, I'm going to kind of eyeball it to the center. You can have your slats going up and down. You can have them going sideways. And it's going to come to about... I want to say it came to like about 2 and 15 sixteenths from every edge. And look at there. I've got it spot on. It is about 2 and 15 sixteenths on this part which means it's probably right about there on this one so i've got it pretty spot on i'm gonna go ahead and adhere mine down i'm gonna really cover the back of this because i want it to secure down to this and it's going to kind of thicken and bulk in this this already thin um back portion and framed out portion so it's going to give it a little more security when we glue it down Because like I said, when we put these grooves in this, the kind of intention of that um, from the manufacturer is to make the foam core kind of bendable and maneuverable. And we don't actually want ours to bend. So I'm off now when I put it back down. I'm just going to slide this in place a little. And here we go. We have a full dimensional nice little piece of artwork and i say little this is 18 by 18 so it's a good size i'm gonna grab the other one so you guys can see them side by side um i really love these pieces i love this bold blue um against the kind of more rustic look it's a nice way to bring in color and still kind of keep a little of your your rustic vibe if that's your thing um, you could have gone in and done whatever color framing that you wanted to um, to really work with your pieces. Um, you can always turn them up and down where the shiplap goes up and down, although I do kind of think I like it sideways. And there you go. That is two full pieces of art. I hope it maybe gave you an idea and... I've got another series coming that's going to coordinate with these that I hope you guys will check out. And that's all. Um, I hope you get a chance to craft today. And I'll talk to you.